Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this RegamerTo.com video, we're going to be discussing tech news which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with AMD, specifically new information on AMD's Pinnacle Ridge. Ryzen processors, then we're going to move over to NVIDIA, because they have indeed killed Moore's Law, so rip to that. Then swerve back to AMD, because we ha are learning that Gigabyte have absolutely no plans whatsoever to release a custom variant of the RX Vega 64 graphics card. And then finally, we'll move back to the familiar waters of deep learning and high performance computing with Microsoft of all companies because they have written a language for quantum computing. In other words, they've written a language for a computer that doesn't yet exist. But we're going to be starting things out, as I said, with AMD. And this information comes to us from Digi Times, and they have sources which claim that we're going to be seeing in 2018, actually not too long in 2018, February to be precise, the release of Pinnacle 7, Pinnacle 5, and Pinnacle 3. So what are those processors? Well, they're essentially a die-shrunk version of the current Ryzen 7, Ryzen 5, and Ryzen 3 chips. Now, those are built, uh, which, by the way, are known as Summit Ridge. Those are built on 14nm, so we're going to see the reduction um, down to 12. And another way you can look at this is the Ryzen 2000 series. Now, According to this report, we're also going to see the 400 series motherboards as well, but those are going to be released a little bit later. Those are going to be released in April. Now, before you start smashing your face against the nearest wall, the good news is, if you even just look at the time frames, there's no point obviously releasing a processor which would not be compatible with the current 300 series if you're not going to release the motherboards which would be compatible for a couple of months. In other words, the current AM4 motherboards will absolutely work wonderfully. Uh, so what we're hearing with these upcoming processors. And another thing is these are not an entire new architecture. So do not confuse these with Zen 2. I did just a few days ago actually cover this. And uh, this is in a completely separate rumor. But... Uh, there has been a roadmap of sorts that was leaked by a website known as Informatica Zero, and this roadmap uh, paints, if you excuse the obvious pun, uh, the Zen 2 cores hitting the shelves of your local retailers in 2019, but that is still going to be Socket AM4 as well. So you're immediately going to say, well, what's going to change? Well, unfortunately, and you guessed it, I don't know. The most obvious change is going to be an increase in processor speed and perhaps also heat reduction, maybe lower voltages, that type of thing. I don't think we're going to have this situation where, I don't know, AMD are going to double the amount of cash or uh, improve the processor's logic or maybe it tweaks the IPC. That's not going to happen. Most likely, we might see some slight tweaks to the processor, perhaps to iron out some bugs. We've known, especially the early versions of uh, Ryzen had a few issues with the uh, processor Zorata, which obviously may be slightly tweaked. Um, and we did, of course, see that impact Linux in very specific circumstances. So most likely what you're gonna see, if you've already got like a Ryzen 7 1700, for sake of argument, that say the 2700, for lack of a better word, isn't suddenly gonna, at least assuming the clock speeds are identical, let's say you're running both at 4 gigahertz, you're not gonna have the 2700 ruffle stomp your old processor, most likely the IPC is gonna be identical, however, what I'm hoping for, and obviously hope does not translate to reality, but what I'm hoping for is these CPUs can be a little bit better when it comes to overclocking. Now that's definitely another point uh, for Ryzen against the Intel juggernaut is that they just don't have the same clock speeds. Now, a couple of hundred megahertz probably won't make that much of a difference, but if they can manage to squeeze three to 500 megahertz, that's for sake of this video, say 400 megahertz addition, that would be quite nice. So if they could, let's say, hit around the 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz on average, depending on the processor and obviously the, you know, the, uh, usual caveats that we know about with um, processor boosting, it would certainly be quite nice to see, let's say, the equivalent of the 2700X 
running at 4.3 to 4.4 gigahertz. That would be absolutely fantastic. But as usual, we're just going to have to wait and see. Now we're going to move to NVIDIA. Now I know typically I do bundle AMD news one after the other, but I just think this one's quite interesting. Uh, this information, <laughs> I stress the word information in very loose terms, uh, comes to us from NVIDIA's CEO Jensen Huang. Now honestly there is a lot of information that's popped up at the GPU Technology Conference, also known as GTC, and quite honestly I've not had time to read it all. So this is just kind of... Um, uh, a small tip then of that there is an awful lot when it comes to deep learning and other bits and bobs that quite frankly I, I just don't have the time to read over the next couple of days uh, to put something really um, informative for you guys out however I did quite I did find this rather amusing uh, Huang has made a statement when delivering a keynote speech at GTC uh, this is based upon the topic of and a quote AI trends challenges and opportunities quite the mouthful and Huang marked that uh, not only is Moore's law not in danger of failing, because obviously for a while there we were concerned that Moore's law might actually no longer be a thing which is pertinent to today's computing, as after all, as processes become increasingly more complex and, well, dice sizes have uh, already ballooned so big and we've already re reduced the processes so much, it's no longer like we're at, like, I don't know, uh, 80... NM or whatever, and now we're trying to shrink down to like 60 or whatever the case may be. It's obviously now considerably more difficult than that. However, uh, he now stresses that, at least in his mind, uh, GPU computing has essentially made, uh, made it so that Moore's Law is essentially just dead. It's been outdated. It's been annihilated. Why has he come to those conclusions? Well, he believes this because the number of CPU transistors have grown at a, quote, annual pace of 50%, the CPU's performance has only advanced by around 10%. He then disclosed that Alibaba, Beidou, Tencent, JD.com, and iFlyTech, which incidentally are China's top five e-commerce and, e and AI players, excuse me, have essentially embraced NVIDIA's Volta architecture. This is for their cloud services. Uh, there's also Hawaii, uh, Inspur and Lenovo, who are also deploying the firm's HGX-based GP, uh, GPU servers. He also showcased another uh, product, the latest one, which is Tensor RT3, which is essentially a programmable uh, accelerator. Now, what does all of this mean? Well, in his mind, anyway, the GPU era is here, especially when it comes to this type of thing. I have done multiple videos before on CPUs versus GPUs, so I don't really want to take up a large swathe of this video discussing that. But in my mind anyway, I do agree with him. GPUs definitely have their place. It's quite interesting because just yesterday I put out a different video, which is from Intel's perspective and how they are, of course, working on uh, essentially learning, uh, creating, excuse me, a self-learning chip. And it's going to be very interesting in the next several years and how all of this develops, um, especially now we're not only having self-driving cars becoming more popular, but deep learning and the process of artificial intelligence is incredibly important. Not only is this stuff, and obviously I'm being very general on this statement, not only is this stuff quite useful for, I don't know, self-driving cars or perhaps more smart robots, that type of thing. But it's also for other things. For example, let's say that you've got an account with Amazon. They're a pretty classic example. If you've just recently d done a random set of shopping for Marvel Blu-rays, for the sake of argument, so let's say you've bought Guardians of the Galaxy, you've bought uh, the Avengers and a couple of other bits and pieces... What happens? Inevitably, you'll notice when you go back after you've bought those couple of products, Amazon are then going to say, hey, what about this product? And the reason it's done that, of course, is it's essentially been mo uh, monitoring your shopping habits. And this is one of the things that this uh, type of uh, research is really pushing towards. It's essentially to make better predictions on you as a customer. And it's a ra rather large topic, and to be honest, well outside the remit of this video, but I thought I'd just throw it in there anyway. Okay, so now we're going to move on to something a bit different. And this is according to Tom's Hardware. Gigabyte, who are obviously a pretty damn major vendor, AIB, have essentially ruled out the possibility of a custom Radeon RX Vega 64. 
Now, that's not to say that they're totally against the idea for a Vega 56. Now, I'm going to read this verbatim. Um, so far, Asus have shown um, its custom Strix 64. Now, we've seen some of those reviews already appear, although, to be honest, it's not as impressive as perhaps we'd hoped, and there were a couple of issues with that. But according to these reports... Uh, AMD are having problems sending chips to their actual partners, in other words, the likes of Gigabyte and whomever. And on top of that, we all know about the issues with the different uh, height memory and all of this stuff. And there are other reports. I mean, you can Google this stuff yourself. You don't have to take my word for it by any uh, means. You can do a bit of Googling. There's other reports that some vendors were not comfortable, although obviously they weren't saying, you know, John at, you know, uh, Asus or whomever. Some other vendors were saying uh, behind closed doors or, you know, anonymously to the press that they didn't feel comfortable and confident that they could, on the box, for example, say that they've got 100 megahertz above the uh, reference design because they felt that, you know, the temperatures and the, the various, basically the variables of the GPU were just too much. Now, this is kind of a bit of a a pain in the butt and honestly uh, I'll put in a couple of Strix Vega 64 um, benchmarks but you, I'll also link to you to a Strix uh, Vega 64 uh, review as well I'll try to remember to put that in the video description honestly there's not that many of those reviews available I was actually shocked um, there was one that popped up on I believe it was Guru 3D but they had to take it down because there was a major issue with their BIOS and since they've popped it back up and honestly yes of course there is an improvement in some games but not that big of a deal so it looks like if you are one of those folks who are really banking on a custom Vega card, it's a bit tricky. And it's even weirder now because from what I'm hearing, Gigabyte and MSI are very much focused on the GTX 1070 Ti slash Ti. Don't forget that's expected to debut in around a month. That's late October-ish, so it's not too long in the distant future. And that's pretty much probably going to be one of the last graphics card launches this year, at least, you know logically because after that you've got the christmas period you know november december it's not really that much sense to release a card around that time because it doesn't really that much make that much of an impact in the uh that particular quarter's uh financial report okay uh last topic and this one's more for funds is so that's why i'm leaving it to last because i like to put in a couple of fun um stories here and there so Microsoft have um, written a language for a computer which essentially is not more than a theory. It, it doesn't really exist. Now, what it does, from what I'm um, hearing, is that it's unified a programming language and it integrates traditional programming languages like C Sharp and Python, but they want to make it easier for do mainstream computing on more complex machines. What they've done with a individual leading this uh, on this onslaught by the name of Michael Friedman is internally trying to build both a hardware and software for the quote topological quantum computing and also recruited some of the world's um, actual top boffins to do this. What, what do you mean by top boffins? Do you mean like, the, you know, pretty damn good programmers? No. Uh, I'll read out a quote verbatim. Some of the world's preeminent condensed matter and theoretical physicists, material scientists, mathematicians, and finally, computer scientists. So Microsoft are not only developing the actual computer hardware itself, but also working to get the programmers up to speed. And you can actually, by all means, Check out their uh, official website for that. For this, that's Microsoft.com/quantum, and it's actually using uh, the ability to train the Cortana digital assistant in just days rather than months, as one of the examples of why it wants to do this. You know, using those type of examples and not being harsh, but I'm pretty good without a quantum computing. God. Oh, why did they have to use Cortana? Why? Just why? Just why? Anyway, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.